Uh, good morning, thank you very much for having me here. My name is Kirsten, I'm a trustee of the Mortimer History Society. Um, I'm here today to give a brief overview of the history of the Lordship of Usk, its early history, uh, the tussles between the Normans and the Welsh, and uh, how Usk Lordship formed, um, and how it, uh, how it formed up until the 14th century, when it was inherited by Elizabeth de Burr. Um, I'm currently writing the third volume of the uh, March and Lordship series for the Mortimer History Society, which will cover Rusk, and um, I'm looking forward to talking to everyone today. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me. I'm very, very excited to be here. Um, it's such a privilege to be in an actual Marcher castle and talking about the history of the castle and being in the place where many of the, of the owners uh, that we're going to hear about in the next 30 minutes or so have been. So thank you very much for having me. Um, like Will, I've been uh, scratching my head how to approach this because I've got something like 280 years of history to get through. Um, so it's going to be quite a gallop. Um, so um, strap down, it's going to be a bumpy ride. Um, <laughs> But I hopefully I can give you a brief overview of the March of Lordships, this and um, Usk being one, uh, which are fascinating, and why people went to great lengths to acquire one, and how they tried to retain them. Um, give me back my inheritance is a quote, direct quote from Elizabeth de Burr. Um, we will get to her um, towards the end, but I wanted to start with what her inheritance was. Uh, this is the Marchship of um, the March of Lordship of Usk in 1360. Um, you can see the red lines. It's a rather strange looking region. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and there are reasons for that, and that is the history that has gone before and why it has formed to this um, to this sort of uh, looking uh, back in 1360. So uh, forgive me um, if you know this, but I thought I might just say what a March of Lordship is, just in case anybody doesn't really know. Um, Philip Hume has written about the March of Lordships, and I can't really do any better than what he has said. Um, there were nearly 50 March of Lordships. Um, they were in the Welsh marches. They became a unique border region that lay between Wales and England. It had its own laws, it had exceptional powers, and it was referred as the March of Walia. And it was neither England nor Wales. So these March of Lords had quasi-regnal powers. They could build castles, they could raise taxes, uh, they were exempt from uh, crown taxes, they could raise an army, wage war, had their own laws and courts, they could raise tolls, have booty from shipwrecks. I mean, the, the list goes on. So they were lucrative. And I don't think it takes a genius to work out why they were so desirable. Land means power and prestige. So the many evolving lordships of Usk were shaped by these marcher families, but they were also shaped by conflict, by the Welsh, the English crown itself, the failure of heirs, the need for dowry, natural resources and their exploitation, and occasionally a bit of legal chicanery. So the lordships of Usk and is not a fixed area. Usk moves around. Usk moves into different lordships at different sides, at different times. It's a layered history, and there are many lordships of us, so we're going to look at some of them. Uh, we'll start at the beginning. Um, so, uh, with the uh, arrival of the Normans, the ruling king, uh, Welsh king, is a chap called uh, Caradog uh, Griffith, and he was ruler of Gwent, Gwynclug and Glamorgan, and he rose to power after the death of um, Gruffydd ap Llewellyn, and he was uh, a successful ruler. Um, he claimed back this land from Gruffydd, 
and he wanted his grandfather's old kingdom of De Habeth. So his whole focus was towards De Habeth. That's what he wanted. So he got Glamorgan back, and then he was fighting for De Habeth. And when the Normans came, he had quite a good relationship with them. He turned up to parties, and uh, he used Norman troops. So I think we can assume that he had quite a good relationship, because if he was fighting wars on his western front, he couldn't have a contested eastern border. Um, Unfortunately, he died at the Battle of Minnith Khan in 1081, um, and um, he had one son called Owain that we know of, who inherited more on him in a minute. Um, but we only have, in this period, under uh, William the Conqueror, very limited Norman penetration into Gwent, and it was mostly around US Lacey, Monmouth and the littoral coast of Gwent. So just a few pockets. And um, I think we need to say that the map which I've got here, which is William Rees, um, for the year 1100 is completely misleading. Um, under William Rufus, there was a change of policy towards Wales. Uh, William Rufus had to uh, deal with a number of rebellions. Mm -hmm. And so to get rid of these pesky barons, he said, can you go and um, please invade the Welsh and just keep yourself busy and stay out of my hair. Yeah. Um, and uh, they did exactly that. So there was large scale uh, Norman conquest into Brecon, into Gwent, up to the Usk As Valley. And of course, Fitzhamond crosses over from Bristol into Glamorgan. But I think, you know, this is a rather fanciful map. This, you know, they did not control these vast areas. This is based on later lordships. I think we have to understand that lordships at this moment, round about the early 12th century, were small centres of Norman control based around the valleys and the coast. They weren't big. So, moving on to the 1130s, towards the end of Henry I, this is what the Usk Valley sort of looked like, as far as we can tell. Uh, there were small proto-lordships um, at Abergavenny under Brian Fitzcount. Uh, Usk, we'll come to in a minute. Uh, we got with documentary evidence for uh, Killian with a Ballon brother. Uh, Clebeneth was a Candos family. And of course, we had Robert, Earl of Gloucester, in Glamorgan, holding Newport, because um, uh, Gwyn Klug at the time was included in the Lordship of Glamorgan. Um, now, there is very, very slight evidence for a family, a Norman family, called the Tankervilles, holding Usk at this time. Um, David Crouch has written about this in the Gwent County History. Um, it is slight. Um, we don't have much evidence, but we know it was taken from the Normans, so we know somebody must have been there. And the Normans were complacent. Uh, the guest of Stavani calls it a second England. That's how they viewed it. They thought they were safe. Um, boy, were they wrong. <laughs> um, so, back to Caradog and his family. Owain um, was, um, had three sons that we know about, and uh, the two that we're interested in is Morgan and Lorth. Uh, they were very unusual for Welsh brothers. Uh, they worked as a pair, and they didn't try to murder one another. <laughs> Extraordinary. Um, and, um, but they did murder somebody, and the person they murdered was Richard de Clare, Lord of Ceredigion, um, north of Abergavenny in 1136. Um, he was the leading marcher lord. Now, we know about the Declares, this is the main branch, and he was murdered, um, uh, in, as I said, in 1136, and this kicked off a huge Welsh rebellion right through Usk Valley. Now, Morgan and Yorworth managed to take Usk, Kelly and back, and Clebeneth. So a huge slash right across Norman territory, cutting off Chepstow from Newport. It was a military disaster quite frankly. Um, now, the Norman magnates who were involved in this, of course, were bogged down with the beginnings of the anarchy. 
in England, so they didn't have the time and the resources to do anything about this. So they just made their peace and just lived with the consequences. Um, and Robert, Earl of Gloucester, actually, um, as long as Morgan acknowledged him as his overlord, actually rather uh, used Welsh troops, probably from Morgan, in the Battle of Lincoln and in other engagements during the anarchy. So, King Morgan um, is looking, he's sitting pretty. He's ruling over Rusk. We don't know what it looked like. I'd be fascinated to know, but we don't, unfortunately. And, uh, but Usk is subsidiary to Kellyn. That's the main centre of the Welsh lordship at this time. That changes later. But uh, at this point, um, Kellyn is more prestigious to the Welsh. But there is trouble looming on the horizon, and that is the Declares, who have not forgotten, and they want revenge, and they want their lands back. Well, they consider it their lands because they think they were lords of um, Lower Gwent. Um, so, unusually, uh, Yorwick succeeds to the inheritance peacefully, uh, round about 1158. Again, this is extraordinary. There's no bloodletting, no gouging out of eyes or anything like that. Um, and, um, and in Chepstow, uh, Gilbert de Clare, uh, the Earl of Pembroke, inherits from his uncle. He was the younger brother of the murdered Richard de Clare. And he's succeeded in turn by his son, Richard Strongbow, who we all know, the invader of Ireland. Um, now, Henry II and Strongbow don't get on very well. And um, Strongbow is a bit annoyed. He's been denied his um, earldom of Pembroke. He's kicking his heels. He doesn't know what to do. So he thinks, I know, I'm going to go and beat up the Welsh because it's going to make me feel better. And that's what he does. Um, so he retakes Usk from Yorworth uh, sometime between 1165 uh, to 1170 because he's got to go over to Ireland. So that sort of gives us some sort of date range for this. Um, and Usk then becomes subsidiary to the Chepstone Lordship, the Declare Lordship of Striegel, if it's often known. And it becomes part of the Declare inheritance uh, spanning France, Ireland, Wales and England. Um, Yorwith doesn't take this lying down and uh, he um, tries to rebel and invades the Clare lands. Henry II tries to mediate, he's also trying to mediate with Strongbow in Ireland, so he's a bit fed up with Strongbow at this point. But um, it takes about five years because Henry II is trying to firefight in several different places. Um, and it's not until about 1175 that things are actually settled. Uh, we believe Usk goes back to Strongbow. There, isn't, there is no written evidence for that, but what comes later sort of rather suggests it. And uh, Yorworth is allowed to keep Kelly in. And uh, Will's already mentioned it, but we have, hallelujah, a mention in the Crown, um, in the Crown documents for Us Castle in 1185. Because, of course, Strongbow has died, and he has a son called Gilbert, who's young, so the uh, Crown is looking after uh, Us Castle, and we do get an entry, which is great. So... In 1185, uh, we know that William St. Ledger and Roger Wernford return accounts. They spend £10 on the castle, as well as mentioned. The farm generates a healthy £36. There are pleas from the court, £5. And we also have four watchmen, 10 archers, 15 sergeants, 10 residents, and a chaplain and his clerk. And that's it. Brief, but it's better than nothing. Um, and then, as we've said before, William Marshall marries uh, Isabella de Clare because Gilbert, her older brother, dies and uh, she inherits the whole shebang. And William Marshall, married to Isabella de Clare, decides to carry on the de Clare blood feud with the House of Gwynclue, which is Howl of Carleon. Um, unfortunately, he, um, I have to contradict Jeremy Knight here. Hal does live into um, the um, 
he does live till about 1216. He doesn't die in 1175. Um, and William Marshall um, uh, carries on the good work of the de Clares, taking back um, uh, lands from the House of Green Klug, and he takes Curleon in 1217 from Morgan App Howell, uh, who is the son of Howell. Uh, Howell has died during the fighting at some point in 1216, um, and he adds it back to his <coughs> Chepstow lordship. So we now have a pairing of Usk and Curleon for the first time. The Marshalls have, uh, William Marshall has five sons. Um, the second is Richard Marshall. He's drawn into rebellion um, with the new King Henry III at this point. Um, he inherits, um, he was meant to stay in France and stay and, um, and uh, have the lands of the marshals in France, but his older brother dies, so he comes across, and um, he rebels. I won't go into the reasons for this, it's very complicated, but Usk um, un comes under siege in 1233. Henry III diverts a army that was on its way to Ireland, and he, um, he marches it against Richard Marshall. So um, Usk comes under siege, um, Richard and Henry III come to some sort of agreement and um, Richard agrees to hand over Us Castle to Henry III and then he's meant to get it back in 15 days. But Henry III reneges on this and so Richard just takes it back. Um, all five of the Marshal um, sons die childless. So in 1245, the whole martial patrimony is broken up between five sisters. Um, and so the lordship of Chepstow, or Striegel as it's often known, is split into three parts. Um, Chepstow goes to the earls of Norfolk, the Bigods. Kellyan goes to the Deveshi family. And us goes back to the main branch, which is Richard de Clare, Earl of Gloucester and Lord of Glamorgan. So again, split. Um, so Usk is now subsidiary to Glamorgan, but it's also split because, of course, it's um, sort of floating on its own because other people own other bits, and that's quite important. Um, And I'm just going to put this up because Will mentioned it, um, but um, we have this marvelous account for Usk in 1262, which gives us some sort of uh, records for the, um, the Usk castle and the manor of Usk, which is the farm around it. Um, this is during the wardship of Gilbert, the Red Earl, who's, we've already, spoke, uh, who's already been spoken about. Um, and Humphrey de Boone, who is the Earl of Hereford, based up in uh, Brecon, is looking after it. And he does a very good job. This is a very contentious time um, because um, Clewellyn uh, <coughs> Griffith is um, attacking down into this area. So Usk is on red alert. Um, so the castles of the Clares um, have to be garrisoned. So we get this wonderful account. Um, so we're still getting £37 for the farm and the rents. Uh, we get £7 from the borough and the market. Um, a whole 19 shillings for tolls. Uh, £4 for mills. 6 for fines and pleas. That's the court. And then a whole £15 for the sale of the timber blown down by the wind. <laughs> Whether that's usual or whether they just had a big storm that, that year, I have no idea. Um, but then we get the expense. So that all sounds like great money coming in. Um, but then we have the expense of the garrison of the castle, and that's £54. And this is only for six months. And um, so we've got constables, our horses, servants, men at arms and their horses, more servants. Jailers, porters, cooks, washerwomen, watchmen, 
foot soldiers. They all cost money. So I think, you know, when we talk about March of Lordships being very lucrative, we also have to remember that they are also very expensive because uh, the Crown is not doing any of the heavy lifting for you. So you have to pay for this. And as I said, it's a very, very contentious time and uh, your castle could come under attack at any time. So um, we just have to bear in mind that they're also very expensive. Um, moving very swiftly on to uh, Gilbert de Clare, the Red Earl. He's hugely important. He's a domineering magnet and he's a March Lord Supreme and I do not have time to talk about him in huge detail. Um, he had lots of money. However, Usk is given in dower to Maud de Clare, uh, Gilbert's mother, um, in 1263. Now, Gilbert is disgusted at this because she's given quite, uh, he believes he's been given more than her legal right to a third. Um, and um, he actually takes his own mother to court to try and get back some of the manners and the lordships that she's been given. Um, but that takes quite a while. So uh, Maud is the, uh, well, it lives or owns Us Castle from at least 1263 to 1267 when he manages to negotiate back Us Castle from his mother. But she keeps the borough and she keeps the farm and she keeps other, lord, uh, other manors throughout the lordship of Usk. So he doesn't get it all. And she lives until, ooh, 1287 or something like that. So it's quite a long time into his, into his reign, so to speak. Um, but Gilbert uh, oscillates between uh, the de Montforts and the Royalist Party, but he just plumps with the Royalist Party during the Barons' War. And um, so therefore, he's top dog in the Southern Marches in the 1260s. And like any rich, sort of very young man, he decides to go shopping and spend some money because he's still got quite a lot of money. Um, we think roughly anywhere between four to six thousand pounds per annum. And um, as I said, Usk is detached from his main lordship of Glamorgan and Grinclug, so he wants to start filling in the holes. So he does this by hook, by crook. And um, he buys Caerleon from the two Deveshi sisters who own the castle and the manor separately. He might buys them round about 1268. So then Caerleon comes back into the lordship of Usk, but Usk is the main center. So Caerleon now becomes subsidiary to Usk. Um, but then the ruling, well, the leading Welshman, which is still part of the House of Grinclug, that family still continue, they're still hanging on to Edligan and Clebeneth, which were parts of the, their old lordship of Caerleon. Now, when Edward I goes on crusade, uh, Gilbert just takes it from them by force and just pushes them out. So he's beginning to put back a whole block of land together. Um, but that's not quite the end of the story uh, for Robert, uh, I mean, for Gilbert. He has, um, Edward I, of course, um, tries to bring him down a peg or two because he gets a bit too big for his boots. But also, the uh, Meredith who uh, had owned Edligan and Clebeneth, he rebelled against uh, Gilbert in 1294-95, and this caused huge, huge um, chaos in, throughout the Earl's lands in Gwent and Glamorgan. Usk, the town was burned. Um, uh, Gilbert dies in uh, 1295, feeling rather broken, um, but we have his Inquisition's post-mortem and some 180 houses or plots in the borough are burnt and void and the rest are looking pretty sorry for themselves. So this is, uh, um, and that is repeated throughout the whole of the Earl's lands. So it was a major rebellion. Uh, one that doesn't really get um, a lot of attention. Um, 
So we move into the 14th century. Um, Gilbert has a son called Gilbert, of course, um, um, and he dies at the Battle of Bannockburn again without an heir. I mean, what is it with these people? Um, so, um, but he has a wife. They've been married for about seven years. She pretends to be pregnant for three years, <laughs> uh, which is great. Um, uh, Edward II, who's the king at the time, thinks this is brilliant because it's giving him an income stream while she's conveniently being pregnant. But, um, you know, uh, this farce sort of has to end at some point. And in 1317, the partition of the Declare lands, which are enormous, happen. There are three sisters. This, um, there are three sisters. There's Eleanor, married to Hugh Dispenser the Younger. She, she receives, or he receives, the Lordship of Glamorgan. Uh, Gwyn Clug is separated for the first time from Glamorgan. And that is given to Margaret and her hus second husband, Hugh de Orderly. Uh, she's forced to marry him in 1317 by Edward II. He's one of, Hugh Orderly was one of his favorites at the time. Um, and um, Matilda, uh, Gilbert de Clare's widow, receives Usk and Carleon in dower until her death in 1320. So we are finally seeing how that of the map which I showed you at the beginning uh, in 1360, uh, how it arrives after the partition. So this is, gives us, us it's pretty much its final form. Um, but of course, um, Eleanor, um, she, uh, we talked about her husband's, um, she was forced to marry Roger Damery in 1317. She had been abducted by her second husband, um, back in 1316, because um, he was hoping to have a part of the uh, declare inheritance. Um, unfortunately for him, he died before, so she was married off to another of Edward II's favorite in 1317. Uh, but the course, the, um, the problem is uh, Hugh Dispenser the Younger. Um, he becomes Edward II's biggest, most vicious and nastiest favorite ever. Um, during the 1320s and he wants to stick back the declare lands by hook or by crook um, and he wants Gwyn Klug, he wants um, Gower, he wants, he wants everything and he wants us and this results in a war in the marches, the Dispenser War and, and it starts in 1321. So the suspensers actually triumphed um, in 1322. Uh, they saw off all their opposition. Um, uh, the opposition was defeated in the Battle of Boroughbridge in 1322. And um, Hugh Dispenser then went about uh, with Edward II's blessing um, about acquiring all the bits that he wanted back or thought he should have. Elizabeth, who was a widow at the time because her damery didn't survive very long, he died um, during the war. And um, she was arrested at Usk on spurious grounds and she was locked up in Barking Abbey near Reddy for half a year. Um, she was forced to exchange Usk for the less valuable Lordship of Gower by the king, who then immediately gave it to Hugh. Um, and then Hugh Dispenser uh, then came for her uh, by some pretty shady legal means and uh, took Gower from her. He got uh, one of the de Breos uh, family to um, take her to court and say that it belonged to him. So de Breos won it and then of course immediately gave it to Hugh. So we have this extraordinary uh, letter or document by Elizabeth de Burr, um, a protest as she calls it, in 1326. This is when Hugh Dispenser and Edward II were still reigning supreme. This is just before the invasion of Isabella and Mortimer. And this is an extraordinary three-page document. This is only part of it. But she is absolutely determined that she won't go down quietly and she protests this so she wants it written down in a legal document noted by a notary to say that this is against her will and it's quite brave because if this document had got into Edward II's hands she probably would have been 
either killed or locked up or locked up in the tower. Um, but she's not going to um, give up. So she wants her inheritance back and she gets it. Uh, the story ends for her very happily after all those husbands and abductions and imprisonments. Um, Edward II is deposed, Hugh de Spencer is, um, is um, killed, and um, she regains all her lands. And she lived a very long and settled life as a very, as a very, very merry widow. Uh, for 30 years, and um, there was little to disturb her, perhaps the Black Death, but um, apart from that, she enjoyed a millionaire, millionaire lifestyle. She had many prolonged visits to Usk, which she seems to have loved, and she treated it as some sort of holiday retreat. Um, Usk was providing some thousand pounds a year in income alone, uh, which is an astonishing amount of money. And um, her wider inheritance gave her an annual income of two and a half thousand a year. So no wonder she was very merry. Um, now, there is one small change to Usk Lordship in the 15th century. Um, so it's not its final form, but I'm going to hand over to Connor now. And he's going to take us through to what the Mortimers did with Usk. But thank you very much. And I'm um, sorry it was a bit of a gallop, but I think we got there. <laughs>